From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our colleague Noel is on an adventure, but he will return soon. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. We go to some pretty dark places in the show, Matt, especially recently. Uh, This is a... This is a... one where we can kick our feet up in the beginning and talk about the finer things in life, you know, mm. because we, <laughs> because uh, despite at least my background here, uh, as I move around this room, uh, we I would say you and I have some refined taste, right? And and most people do. What are what are some oh, examples certainly. of stuff that you? What what are some examples of stuff that you're like willing to spend a little extra money on for the quality? Uh, Café du Monde. (laughs) The most delicious of the café. (laughs) Also, uh, I brought a few things here, Ben. I love it. Pirouette. Mm, Oh, The most delicious hazelnut wafers. (laughs) They're so good. And finally, fine art. Mm. Oh, a fellow Mm. intellectual, I see. Yes. Uh, (laughs) Now those are all those are all fantastic examples, dude. I, I wish I had. I mean, I've got a bunch of creepy old books, of course, but um, that's that's a little <laughs> niche. Uh, yeah, and you know, you nailed it. Those are excellent examples, and a- almost everybody, I would say, not just the people listening today, we all have refined taste for like at least one or two things or another. You know, you might be really into classic cars. You, you don't care what. You don't care a whit about coffee, but you need to have a good classic car. You might be a sneakerhead. You might only have limited release, you know, Jordans. You might spend a lot of time and income chasing down limited release music or rare books or expensive clothing. Or Zildjian symbols. I get it. Oh, yeah. Zildjian symbols. One of the world's oldest continually functioning companies, I think. Actually, might be the world's oldest. Hmm. And they are mass produced uh, for the most part, but there are some. Yeah. Oh, there are some <laughs> rare Zildjian. That's awesome. And, you know, it might be like um, we have a pal, a friend of the show, the one and only Mr. Ramsey Yunt, who is a producer here with us. Uh, in, he has a particular, particularly refined taste for Japanese whiskey. And I know it's a whole thing, it's a whole genre. But, with all of the examples that you and I are naming, each of those has become the foundation of a massive global industry. And today, uh, you beautifully set us up for exploring one of the most high-end, most mysterious of, of these industries, the weird world of fine art. It's a place, picture it, fellow conspiracy realists, where the rich, the creative, and the criminal mingle in the oddest of Venn diagrams, a business that orbits the lives of some of the world's most powerful people. It's a world that is alien to the vast majority of human beings alive today, and honestly, many of the art world's insiders Hope and pray that it stays that way forever. Why? Well, uh, here are the facts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so this art world that is uh, rather, you know, foreign to many of our experiences is actually vast. Very, very large. Much larger than you imagine in your head and probably that you assume. Uh, and it's always been... I don't know. There's there's a fascination to it. If you think back to films that you've seen, anything from Ocean's Eleven to I don't know, Ben. You'd have to name like a few other of these uh, Bond films. There's a this aristocracy <laughs> 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 to to this stuff, um, you know. And you you just imagine the money in this space because you you may even if you don't know much about the art scene, you may have seen. Uh, galleries or auctions where just millions and millions of dollars are being thrown around 
at art. And you think, why? <laughs> right. And you, you, you nail, like you nailed it. I love the, I love the image. It's a trope now of people aggressively bidding for something. I was just playing finally uh, uncharted four. If you Ooh, remember the uncharted choice. series. Yeah. And there's a, uh, <laughs> there's, there's a auction scene and this is not a spoiler, but there's an auction scene where people are trying to bid on a an artifact. We'll touch on the world of antiquities a bit today, too, I suspect. And it there's is, a lot of cross pollination there. Yeah, exactly. And it's beat for beat. Uh, the scene you see in films where there's like one guy who's holding up his little, you know, his little sign thing. You know, and like two million, do I have two million, two million, two million, what, three million, do I have 3.5, 3.5? And then, you know, some other guy makes a stink face and he's like, oh, yeah, 3.5. And then it just keeps going. And then, you know, inevitably there's, it's usually, I think, the bad guy who just gets tired of the cat and mouse game and throws up their little uh, thing and their little paddle and just names a stupidly high number and they're like 500 billion dollars and everyone's like oh wow dang uh now we have to do a heist (laughs) (laughs) and there is a reason for pushing up the price of art in that way that i'm sure we'll be talking about later this episode oh boy yeah I mean, it's it's a contradictory world, isn't it? It's also one that has long been a subject of special fascination for the disciples of the dismal science, economists. At the most basic level, the art market is it's just a bunch of people buying stuff. It's a bunch of people selling stuff, and they're just happen to be trading in works of art, or we could loosely call them art-related services. There are two parts two big categories, the primary market, that's where new art hits the scene. And then the secondary market, that's for art that has been sold at least once before. And the art market, it's not the same as buying a used car. The used market or the secondary market is where you see a lot of the big money changing hands because the price of the secondary market is usually going to be dictated by the price at which a given piece sold the first time around, um, but not quite. There's a reason the economists like this. Well, without getting too in the weeds, eggheads dig it because it involves so much more than just supply and demand. Yeah. If you imagine with the Zildjian symbols, you've got certain components that make this thing up, you know, uh, different metals that are smelted down to then create this thing. And it's, it's, uh, I I I man I might be I might be stretching here a little bit but I'm just imagining that with with art it is something that is created out of those components but it's a brand new thing and you have to uh value has to be placed upon that part of it and that value is very subjective. <laughs> yeah, beautifully put and I love I love that you're bringing up the aspect of the components there Matt because Let's take that Zildjian example, which is awesome. You can all you can predict the cost of the components, right? And then yeah. you can pre- you can predict the amount of labor, right, required mm-hmm. to make one symbol. And then with that information, you can predict the price you can sell it at, and then you can predict the profit. But in the world of art, like it's such a good question: How much did the canvas and the paint cost for the Mona Lisa? Right. Mm. Because you're, you're not buying the cost of the paint at this mm-hmm. point. Uh, it's it's a fantastic point, And it's something that economists spend a lot of time on because of that subjective value. How do we how do we quantify it? How do we put a number on a non quantitative thing? That's why the art world has elements of what they would call a prediction market. The art in question has kind of a fluid, fluctuating financial value and that cultural value is a huge piece of this, you know, like um, the right real world circumstances can massively increase the value of a given artist work. Sadly, when they die, that that has that becomes a big deal. We can talk about that. And um, maybe when the movers and shakers of the art world, like an influential critic says, this is the new Basquiat, right? Or Mm -hmm. this is 
this is the next, you know, Frida Kahlo or something, then boom, people want to be someone who already had their finger on the pulse. Uh, this this also can happen with things like Beanie Babies, by the way. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And Magic Cards. Uh, but it is, <laughs> it's weird to think that value can be generated out of nothing from a piece, a single piece of art because of its like singular cultural value. But then similarly, it can be placed on the creator of that art, right? All of a sudden, anything this artist touches is going to be elevated up to that level, which is a, a, I don't know. It's so strange to me that both can, can occur. And the only way that that's generated is by other people deciding that that artist or piece of art is worth X amount of millions. Yeah. And, you know, you and I are lucky enough to know a lot of phenomenal artists, uh, both as just uh, friends of ours outside of, of the orbit of this show. And then also, and I'm grateful for this, we have come to know a lot of amazingly talented artists through this show specifically, through stuff they don't want you to know. And it always, I don't know about you, man, but it always makes my day when someone says, hey, you know, I listen to your show while I'm sculpting or doing ironworking or painting, and here's a little thing that I thought you guys would like. And when I see it, (laughs) I have to be honest. I hope this doesn't come back to bite us. But usually when I see those things, my first thought is, damn, that is so much better than the actual show. <laughs> because the level of accomplishment there is is stunning. Well, you know, shout out to Turbo Benson, first of all. But also, yeah. this piece of art that I held up, uh-huh. this is an original Nagel, like a Georgia Nagel. From, it's a local artist here in Georgia. I have mm-hmm. two in my collection. <laughs> and it is seriously... Amazing stuff. So look out for it. Uh, it'll be going on auction sometime in 2023. That's amazing. Good <laughs> Not really. Not uh, really. <laughs> well, you say that now, but we never know. And we the reason we never know is because there's another, there's another weird thing that comes into play in the economics of the art world. It's called the greater fool principle. Oh, it boy. means... Yeah, somebody will pay a certain price for something, even if it might seem crazy high, because there's an assumption, or let's be honest, a bet made that later they'll be able to sell it to somebody else for a higher price. And that person will later often attempt to do the same. So it's kind of like a, a snarky name for what happens. Uh, but what what it's implying is that It might be foolish for me to buy this thing at this price, but there will be someone more foolish than me in the future. Somewhere down the road. (laughs) Somewhere. Surely I am not the world's dumbest person uh, or most foolish. Are we saying art, fine art is a really long game hot potato? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> um, for some people, actually, yeah, you know, for some people it is. And of course, for others, this is just something that is of great personal, historical or cultural value. You know, like sometimes you'll see a well-heeled philanthropist buy up, uh, um, buy up pieces from an artist who they feel is underappreciated who comes from their hometown or their home region or their, you know, their home community. And they'll do it because they want to inspire the people living in that, in that place. You know, um, I'm just making up an example. I don't have a specific one, but let's say there is a multimillionaire maybe in Botswana or maybe in Panama or whatever, and they want to have a museum with local art to enrich the culture of the people living in Botswana or Panama, then they might spend a lot of money buying this stuff and making a museum for it. And to them, it's just a good deed. You know, there's nothing crooked about it. But when we look at stuff like uh, Stuart Plotner's work for American Anthologist, we see that this is a distinct, strange financial ecosystem. First, it's notoriously opaque. There is absolutely no way to get a full, comprehensive, high-level look at private sale data. Absolutely no way. Zero zip zilch way. Uh, And added to that, about half of the global transactions in the art world are thought to be composed entirely of private sales. That's the last part. Let's put emphasis on global there. Ooh, it's huge. It's huge. Let's talk stats. 
Oh, and we, man. And just, yeah, like, yeah. stats for sure. Just to get into that, what we're talking about here, we mentioned all the auctions and everything. Uh, that's often public. That's often like promoted. Like, hey, check sure. out our auction. This is happening. Look at all of the transactions that are occurring here. When we're talking about private sales, it's just, hey, Ben, I've got this Nagel. Ben goes, okay, I'll take it for this amount of money. Done. That's a mm-hmm. private sale. That's It's over. Uh, and who knows how much Ben paid for it. Uh, but still, like, this is crazy. I certainly don't tell Paul when I'm selling it to him. No. Like, Paul, I got this Nagel. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had it for a year yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some weird rules in there, too. But let, let's jump into these stats, like you said, Ben. Yeah. Throughout last year, 2020, the global art market was valued at $50 billion. $50 billion for art. Okay. And uh, when we're talking about that lack of transparency like that we're discussing right here, $50 billion is probably not quite it. Could be a little more, a little less. Who knows? Right. But we're going to we'll use it as our running number, at least for this conversation. But here's the deal. Uh, That number, 50 billion, is actually significantly less than what was spent in the previous year before COVID. In 2019, it was around 64 billion dollars. So 14 billion got knocked off the top when galleries and other places were closed and auctions weren't able to be, you know, produced the same way that they were in the previous year. And people are still guessing, right? Again, that you pointed out how muddy that number is because there is zero accountability in the private, uh, the private aspects of this market. This number, this fifty billion dollars, go ahead and doctor evil your pinky up there with us, folks. Mm. Is uh, it, it represents somewhere around thirty one point four million known transactions, meaning thirty. 1.4 million different individual sales of art that are known to have occurred over the course of 2020. The U.S. has the most skin in the game or pain in the canvas. They have the highest total share of the global market. China has the highest share of fine art auction revenue. That's the stuff That's the stuff you're talking about, right, Matt? The money that churns when outfits like Christie's or Sotheby's hold auctions for Picasso's and Monet's and what have you. So, We've explained a little bit about the sheer financial depth of the market, but this also sets us up to talk about the ways in which that market might be smaller than outsiders assume. Here's the simple truth. We'll just uh, let the quiet badger be the loud one in this part of the conversation. Yeah, most people can't actually afford to pay millions of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars for a single piece of art unless they have like a clear plan to flip it for profit. The luxury of buying a piece of art for with historical, cultural, personal value and then just like hanging it up in your mansion or your summer cottage that that's or on a your yacht or on your yacht. That's a privilege that's restricted to very, very few people in modern society because of the way inequality works. And like every other industry, the community gets smaller and smaller and smaller at the top, which means that the movers and the shakers, they're increasingly likely to personally know each other, or if they don't personally know each other, they're increasingly likely to know another individual's position in the hierarchy, including their big sales and purchases. That's why sometimes you'll hear somebody described as like a minor collector of contemporary art. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like they, they bought they bought a couple Warhols, but they're not a big fish to the big fish. How much money, just to set this up, are we talking about? In 2017, the auction house Christie's sold Da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi for $450.3 million. That's one painting. That's one sale. That's a lot of money. That's more money than most people will ever see in the entirety of their lives. And it was sold to someone in the upper echelons of the Saudi government or within the family, the crown, a close associate of the crown prince. I mean, that's what you get to Saudi government and Olive Garden have the same, same tagline. When you're here, you're family. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but just talking about this hierarchy, there's a story yeah. you can read about from several years ago where Daniel Ratcliffe, uh, you know, Harry Potter, you yeah. say, this guy's probably got some money. This guy's really well known. Uh, he was attempting to buy some fine art, but he was refused by, I believe, the person running the gallery. 
as oh. in like I'm we're looking for you know someone a little more <clears throat> suited to purchase this art like someone within the art world right more he got, an insider he, he got new moneyed he got new moneyed uh like, again like i don't know the full story i was reading it in one of the articles i was going through today but he eventually got to purchase the painting because the artist himself found out that it was daniel radcliffe and was like uh yeah you can buy my painting but the uh, the nice. gallery or the people selling it wanted to keep it insular within that the mm. high art world yeah. Oh, wow. And and that sounds like if the artist hadn't have known, they would have had no control over that. Interesting. Interesting. That kind of avoids the free market idea that's so often touted. These two examples show us some pretty fascinating stuff. In the case of that Da Vinci, this sale was unprecedented. It blew it blew all the previous records out of the water. And it emphasized something that happens in the secondary market. Artists can become incredibly profitable once they've died because, you know, they're not making any new sculptures or collages or paintings. The supply is inherently limited. And if demand increases for any reason, prices can skyrocket. And yes, to be fair, when we're talking about the da Vinci's of the art world, we're kind of talking about the equivalent of blue chip stocks. They're priced way above what most other art in the world would be priced. And as you can imagine, we got to talk about controversies. We're not even at the crazy part yet. With this much money, with this much opacity in play, there's more than enough room in the shadows of the auction house for crimes and conspiracies. It would be actually, it'd be pretty astonishing if this wasn't the case. Art theft's a big deal. We already talked about epic art heist. Those are just a small slice of the pie because we don't know much about the successful heist where something got whoosh, whoosh, lost or got replaced by a forgery, which does happen more than you think. Uh, there's a thriving black market in stolen goods and in antiquities. This stuff affects everything from like an archaeological dig in the hinterlands of old Samaria to the world's most prestigious museums who may not know that they are uh, participating with the best of intentions in criminal acts. So, and we've heard from curators who listen to the show who have told us, like people working in the world of museums have told us figuring out the provenance of an artifact can be can be really challenging. But people are making their best faith efforts to, you know, help make sure they're not like aiding and abetting war crimes, which is probably something a lot of folks don't anticipate when they're getting into that career. But the truth of the matter is. It's a huge problem, especially with museums and antiquities. Oh, for sure. I would direct everybody over to theatlantic.com to read The Tomb Raiders of the Upper East Side. It, there's a story in, well, there are many stories within that story, but one of them is about the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and how they purchased something from Egypt that was, you know, a, a mummy-less coffin. Right. And they allegedly didn't really under fully understand the provenance of this thing. But it was found after investigators proved that this <laughs> this thing was just taken. This coffin was just stolen and it was made out of almost all gold. And the mummy that was inside of it was just dumped into the river. And it was there were false documents set up to then sell it to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. But they like. They didn't really check anything. They just went, oh, here is an antiquity from Egypt. And they just bought it because they knew the value that it had. And they didn't even check out, you know, how it got to them or who who raided a tomb, essentially, to get it to them. Um, and it's all about, for me, it's about looking away when you're the person making a purchase because you know the inherent value, you know you can flip something. Uh, you look away from the actual provenance of the thing. Yeah. If it is the actual thing, because one of the other big, mm. big problems is is forgery. You've probably heard that old chestnut. Great artists steal while, you know, middling or mediocre artists copy. There's truth to that. And artists themselves have spoken about their influences and different people in the art world go go pretty far in acknowledging when a certain piece of art seems derivative of some earlier work. And this happens in any creative endeavor from music to writing to dance. 
Imitation of that sort is both expected and openly acknowledged by most people involved, but it crosses the line when a talented but unknown artist turns to the dark side and makes fake Kahlo's or fake George O'Keefe's and sells them as the genuine article. This is forgery. It's a continual, ongoing crime, and there are countless examples of very successful forgery operations. You could almost make a yearly list uh, and we like I was looking through this and I found year by year. I didn't find one for 2021, 20, but I found from 2020 on back year by year list of like the most successful forgeries. So it definitely happens. But today's episode is not about forgery, even though it's inherently a conspiratorial crime. It's just the tip of the paintbrush for decades and decades, if not centuries. The world of fine art has been home to another larger conspiracy, conspiracy that is arguably an art all its own. Mm. Money laundering. I know. What are we talking about? Yeah, we'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. Okay, well, the fix is in. The world's most high-ticket art is part of a global business with tons of secrecy and a laughably small amount of toothless regulation. It makes it a great place to hide money if you're trying to avoid the tax ban or if you got a lot of dirty cash in need of a good scrub. Uh, This is where a pretty cool guy named Noriel Rubini, uh, economist and NYU professor, comes into play. What I love about this guy, Matt, he's got a street name, which not all professional economists do. His street name is Dr. Doom because he... (laughs) He made a lot of very dire, incredibly accurate predictions about the housing crisis and financial crash of the early 2000s. So people call him Dr. Doom. I wonder what he's saying about the housing market right now. Uh, Uh, hmm. Doom and gloom, maybe. Who knows? I don't want to look. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But what he shows us is how one person, an individual, can purchase a really expensive piece of art worth, let's say, a million dollars. And they can pay cash, just slide it on over, and there's no need for them to register the transaction. Because there's... uh, uh, Because, well, in some cases, you could get around it, basically. And there's virtually no tie to the financial system when a transaction like that occurs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't need a lot of paperwork involved in this. You know what I mean? Uh, The opaque nature of the art industry also makes it a haven for tax evasion and lucrative pieces of art are exchanged all the time, but not in the way you might think because the artwork might never physically change hands. It can be stored at these things called free ports for an unlimited amount of time. And quick explanation, I think for uh, some of us in the crowd who might not know what free ports are. But may have seen the movie Tenet. Yes, I was going to say Tenet (laughs) is where I think a lot of of folks get hip to it. Um, Don't feel bad if you you haven't seen Tenet or you don't know what free ports are because the truth of the matter is that there are a ton of people who would prefer that you never actually think about these things. So essentially, like, you know, depending on where you live, folks, you probably have some kind of public storage business in your neck of the global woods. And you know, you know what it is. It's a bunch of like tiny garage looking things. And when people have stuff that they don't want to throw away, but they don't have room for in their house or apartment, they rent one of those things like by the month or by the year to store their junk. Very wealthy people do that too, but they do it in a much more sophisticated, expensive manner. Free ports are super secure warehouses for the collections of millionaires and billionaires. This isn't just art. It's not just Picasso. It could be straight up bricks of gold. It could be gold ingots. It could be vintage Ferraris. It could be crazy expensive wine. Uh, These things are found in countries where you would expect a lot of uh, very wealthy people to store very expensive things. Switzerland, Luxembourg, Singapore. Uh, And it's very advantageous to you if you want to avoid paying the government anything because those goods, when they're stored in a free port, they're technically still in transit. So yeah. it's kind it's kind of like they told FedEx to say just tell me it's always on the way. 
Yeah, it hasn't <laughs> quite arrived in the UK yet, so you don't have to pay those taxes. Hmm, when it was being shipped from the US, well, it's just whatever, it's in transit. Yeah, a while back, The Economist reported that uh, the Freeport near the Geneva airport just on its own is suspected to hold the equivalent of a hundred billion US dollars in art. So not counting the Ferraris, nor the wine, nor the ingots of gold and platinum. Uh, This stuff can be stored years, decades. There's really not a time limit. There's one other interesting mechanism of free ports we have to throw in. Once something is inside the free port, like let's say a piece of art is inside the free port, uh, a Ben Bolin original. I make a lot of art, but I don't sell it. Uh, Let's say somehow it ends up in a free port. That art can be sold privately and anonymously to other buyers, and it never has to leave the warehouse. They're just trading money using that thing as, you know, sort of to Mad Lib in uh, what they're buying. Whoa. So you can... That feels like a... Yeah, that feels like a good way... You can't really clean money that way, but it's not, that's a weird thing. Well, you you can in some ways. Anyway, okay. Okay. Uh, Rubini compares this, Dr. Doom compares this to the role that Swiss banks used to play. Uh, he told CNN, you know, they're an alternative. He said, maybe an alternative is just to buy an expensive piece of art and hide it in a free port in Europe. Nobody knows what it is. That becomes the equivalent of a safe deposit in a bank previously in Switzerland. The other thing is, no one is sure about the extent of this problem, even the people making money off of it. Think about it. No one knows the origin of the dirty money. It could be drug money. It could be financial crimes, robberies, trafficking profits, you name it. Also, no one's sure how often it happens, and no one is sure how deep it goes. It's definitely weapon sales, by the way. Uh, so the, uh, the NYT, New York Times, ran a story earlier this year about uh, a very surprising case that you can read right now if you've got enough free New York Times articles. <laughs> or if uh, which you get I had, a subscription. Okay. Yeah, you can't get a subscription if you want to. Um, but I was able to read this. There's uh, an accused drug dealer. His name was Ron- Ronald Bellicchiano, and he was in Philadelphia. And the feds raided his house. They found, you know, the things that you would find of a suspected drug dealer, if they are, in fact, a drug dealer. Lots and lots of marijuana. They found about $2.5 million hidden in a compartment beneath a fish tank, which you can see a picture of. It just looks like a box. And it had cash stuffed in it with a, an aquarium on top of it. Uh, but here's the other thing. They found art. Real art, like expensive, fine art, a whole cache of it. Yeah, they did at a storage unit, not a Freeport, just like a regular Mm -hmm. public storage unit. Uh, Just a few miles away from his house, they found 33 paintings stacked up. Uh, They also found 14 paintings in his home. This wasn't from like his kid's high school painting class. This is stuff like Renoir, Picasso, Salvador Dali. Yeah. Belciano had used the art to launder some of his drug cash. He purchased the works from this gallery near Philadelphia's Museum Row. It's a solid operation, basically, until it isn't. And the NYT sums it up by saying buyers typically have no idea where the work they're purchasing is coming from. Sellers are in the dark about where work is going. None of the purchasing requires the filing of paperwork that would allow regulators to track art sales or profits. It's distinctly different from the way the government can review the transfer of other assets like stocks or real estate. Now we need to talk about the other thing, and I think it's something people in the audience were anticipating. Power is not always limited to money. Money Mm. is just a a medium of exchange for power. It's a coupon system. It's symbolic. The fine art market has also been seen as a way to peddle political influence. And the most notable accusation in the West uh, in recent years for this kind of thing centers on the administration of current U.S. President Joe Biden. Well, kind of on him, mainly on his son. Yes, Hunter. Hunter Biden that you've likely heard a lot about over the past few years, he's attained something that many artists have not. Uh, A level of fame, a level of success that that many can only dream of. He's represented by the 
ultra powerful Georges Berge or B E R G E S gallery in that's in New York, Ben? Yes, yeah, that's in New York. And uh he has his works, his art is expected to cost anywhere from $75,000 to $500,000. Again, Hunter Biden, son of the current president. Right, right. And experts, not just political opponents, have raised ethical concerns here. They're arguing that people might not be paying this much just because they like the art. They may be doing this because supporting Hunter Biden might establish a line of communication and influence with his father, who is currently one of the most powerful people on the planet. In in fact, you know, I found one prominent critic, Walter Schaub, because I I wanted to make sure that the ethical concerns weren't just like, you know, politically Mm -hmm. motivated stuff. So uh, Walter Schaub was an interesting critic of this to me because back in the day, he was actually the director of the Office of Government Ethics under the Obama administration. So you can, you know, make uh, some assumptions about his own political leanings. And he said, I find it deeply troubling. We've got a family member clearly trading on his father's name. The man has never sold a piece of art before, has never even juried in a community center art show, but suddenly he's selling art at fantastical prices. There's simply no way anybody paid 75 grand for anything other than his name. That Mm. sounds kind of cold. And uh, in his defense, Hunter Biden did appear on a couple of outlets. Uh, He was on an art podcast a while back where he said, you know, he was surprised, but he was happy. Uh, He said, I would, you know, be happy if it sold for $10. So painting was a way for him to personally find solace, which is something a lot of painters in the crowd today can agree with. Uh, Yeah, but in this case, you can't argue with the fact that the reason it's that expensive is because of who he is. Uh, I mean, it's that it's that it's that value that's placed upon the art by the outside. Right. And when he's represented by a a powerful gallery, it doesn't hurt. I mean, it definitely has to play at least some role in the success here, partially because when people are buying a name, they're uh, they're also buying a story. Right. When Mm -hmm. you buy when you buy art, you're also buying the story of the person who made it the story of uh, how it traveled from someone's mind through all the, these various adventures to you. So yeah, it's not a crime. It's just ethically unsound to a lot of critics. And really it's not a crime because the legal system doesn't have the vocabulary to articulate this as a criminal offense, but that doesn't make it not shady. And to be fair, Hunter Biden is currently embroiled in other controversies. The U.S. Attorney's Office is digging into his taxes. He stated that publicly. Uh, there were corruption charges raised by the former Trump administration uh, during the last election. Biden's administration dismissed him as a smear campaign. Uh, Hunter Biden is pro- like the thing about Hunter Biden is he doesn't need the money. You know what I mean? He's not sweating the 75 grand probably. He did join the board of a place called Burisma from 2014 to 2019, where he was making an estimated 50 grand a month. So if he chose art over that, he's he's following his passion rather than financial motivation. Yeah, but, but there's a whole thing yeah. with Ukraine there with Hunter Biden, and there's a lot of stuff. I, that, there's a lot. Mm. <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot with Ukraine. Also, I almost, <laughs> I almost texted you and Noel about this, but uh, given the way that Russia is amassing troops on the border, I, I wonder what's going to happen around uh, the end of the year, honestly. Dude, there's so much posturing going mm-hmm. on. Both mm-hmm. sides. I don't know. NATO uh, has a no mm. first strike thing, and they definitely, I don't know. And and also earlier this July, Vladimir Putin uh, published an essay about how you, their, Ukraine has always been part of Russia. Oh, yeah. Like, they're, yeah. they're of the same stuff, basically. They're spiritually yeah. the same place. Yeah, so we'll see what goes on there. And uh, maybe that's an episode for the future. But regardless of what goes down with NATO, Russia, Ukraine, and Crimea, uh, and what revelations come out about corruption on the Western end of that, uh, that we do know one thing. 
No matter what wars occur in the future, the problem of money laundering is only set to continue, to grow, to expand. At least that's what multiple governments assume. We're going to pause for another word from our sponsors, and then we'll return to explore a little bit about how these institutions are at least saying they're going to fight back. So as you know, Matt and I aren't just podcasters. Matt is a tremendously accomplished musician. I write constantly. We're in the world of creative things. We're also, based on this podcast, excited to announce that we're getting into the world of visual creations, not with YouTube, but with fart. That's right. Ben and I are proud to be sponsored by Financial Alternatives to Real Transactions, or FART. It addresses a problem that I'm sure many of us have encountered in our various side hustles. Where do I put all this drug money? Or let's say you've embezzled millions from a charity and need to take it out of the oven of crime to cool it off for a while, and all the usual tax havens are closed down. Yeah, plus those stick-in-the-mud taxmen are prying into all the empty condos we've been buying. And casinos, sheesh, casinos mean that some mob gets a cut and you get stuck with tons of paperwork. That's why we recommend FART. Up until recently, the best way for us to move dirty money from things like regime change, trafficking, badger smuggling, or stamp fraud was to buy regular art. We'd send one of our agents to a Sotheby's, tell them to put a few million into something, whatever really, and boom, call it a day. But those non-criminal, non-fat cats in the world of law enforcement hate to see a good hustle, folks. They're cracking down on good old-fashioned grifting, and it's time for all of us to get ahead of the game. That is where FART Fart comes in. Instead of physically buying art, all you have to do is pull up the handy Fart app. Then just enter the amount of money you need to move. Make up a fun nickname and make sure you never use that nickname again. Never. You'll get an anonymized list of private collections and free ports all across the world tailored to your criminal needs. Click what fits your needs best and Fart takes care of the rest. You don't have to go pick up the painting. (laughs) You don't even have to see it. You can even disable the thumbnails if you don't want to be bothered with looking past the price tag. No pesky regulation, no nagging, and no cries for accountability. Let's say later you need that cash and maybe you want to make a hefty profit. Now all you need to do is set a price for your art wherever it's being stored and within just a few days or hours you'll get an offer. Here's the fun part folks that buyer could be anyone. It could even be you under a different name offering a higher price. With Fart you can take the art from the museum and turn it into a laundromat just like the old masters surely intended. And there's a special limited time offer here. Just for listening to stuff they don't want you to know the good folks at fart are offering 15 percent off the blood price for your first transaction all you have to do is type in the promo code i am a bad person at checkout again for 15 percent off blood price enter the promo code i am a bad person at checkout the fart app is not available on ppp poor people phones the makers of fart are not responsible for any prosecution bad karma dark nights of the soul well-deserved revenge governmental coups regime changes lead poisoning physical seizures financial seizures Come up in shenaniganry or lack of honor among thieves. Fart is a subsidiary of Illumination Global Unlimited. And we return. Yes, governments are paying more attention to this in recent years for a couple of pretty compelling reasons. First, business is booming. You know, earlier, Matt, you and I were talking about how the pandemic made a drop in the overall market, but the big ticket items are selling for increasingly higher prices. And this means that in a single transaction, more money is moving now. It's like an illegal port of entry to the land of legitimate cash. No need for paperwork, no need for disclosure, and no way for the law to look into things too closely, right now at least. Mm Mm-hmm. And second, many of the traditional money laundering avenues have been compromised or shut down. Think about it. The Panama Papers a little while back, the Pandora Papers, people, the world, the public is waking up to a lot of these traditional ways of just moving that money around. Real estate, tax havens, all of these things. The places where both the incredibly rich and the high level criminals (laughs) where they used to stash all that cash, they've just... They've fallen out because uh, people know about them and also because there's increased regulation on those things or rules, especially if you're doing a transaction from one country to another country where that, you know, money would have been stored or moved or uh, cleansed. It's just not happening right now, at least not to the extent that it was. 
Yeah, and so this also means that a certain demographic of the world's most successful scoundrels are suddenly discovering a deep appreciation for art, (laughs) especially the expensive stuff. That's cool. You got to feed your soul. So what is to be done? In a world where it's generally acknowledged that taxes are already for the little people, quote unquote, and corruption is, I would say, a widely accepted open secret, how can government institutions hope to fight the almost entirely invisible kaiju of global financial crime in the art world? Uh, Good news. Uh, Matt, you and I looked into this. We know that the U.S. is taking a stab at it with some new proposed bills, um, Essentially, stuff like the Bank Secretary Act, BSA, and AML, and something called the Combating the Financing of Terrorism Laws. The yeah, the BSA, AML is anti-money laundering, by the way. Yes, anti-money. Yes, thank you, anti-money laundering. The, the BSA already requires people who deal with precious metals, stones, and jewels to report activities that seem sus to the authorities, like Think of like, you know, you buy diamonds and you're pretty sure someone's trying to sell you blood diamonds. You would report that or they're stolen. You would report that. The idea here is to expand those reporting requirements to art dealers in the U.S. Some, you know, some shady entity is like, hey, I want to sell this to you. Two hundred million dollars. And you're like, is that wasn't that painting stolen? (laughs) Well, I don't know where I came from. (laughs) You know what I mean? <laughs> All like, I know it's in my gallery right now. <laughs> so the idea is, and you know, again, gallery owners and, and art buyers and collectors are not, not everybody is in on this. Not obviously. everybody. Not everybody. But now we have to look across the pond. We know the U- the European Union Commission had issued an anti-money laundering directive in 2018 in June, which also expanded the coverage of regulation. So they started they started counting people trading in the world of art as obliged entities, meaning people who had to report suspicious activities. Uh, and they also had to report it if they were storing art in free ports, if the value of a transaction or a group of linked transactions equaled 10,000 euro or more. Yes. That's, that's what they want to happen. Well, and they're they're actually taking some of this stuff into effect. You can read about it right now. Some of the latest news coming out of the UK has to do exactly with this. And that number in particular, 10,000 euros or more, is so low compared to what the other regulators in other countries are trying to establish. Most of the others, like with the United States and a few other European countries, are setting it setting that minimum as like, you know, uh, it has to, if it reaches this amount of money or more, then it has to be reported around a hundred thousand dollars U.S. So this is like, you know, most of the other countries are looking at transactions that are ten times the amount that the European Union wants to look at. Yeah, and like you said, this is something that's still in flux. In some parts of the world, we're in the early days of this kind of regulation. In other parts of the world, it's still kind of in the idea phase. Mm -hmm. You can read a pretty great summation of U.S. laws and and various uh, law review outfits. And we have to point out, of course, not everybody's on board in the view of some art dealers. The legal changes in the U.S. and Europe would strip vendors of one of their big selling points the ability to offer anonymity to clients, either on the buying or selling side. And this anonymity, the desire for anonymity, despite what surveillance states would have you assume, does not necessarily make somebody a criminal. You might just want to sell one thing and you might be doing it because you actually need the money and you don't want people to know. Or you might be doing it because it's just one piece of a larger collection and you don't want to get bombarded by other people who want to buy other stuff in your collection. You know what I mean? Like privacy is a currency all its own. So those parts aren't necessarily criminals. Uh, And in the years back, right back in the day, the fine arts market was often seen as a playground for the, the wealthy, the indolent well to do the socialites and so on. There was no real drive on the part of the authorities to police it to apply laws to it as strenuously as they would to something like banking, 
which they could also use some help regulating banking, but whatever. Only time will tell what happens to this practice, because for now, it's a Wild West. It's a gold mine, baby. Right now, with the appropriate connections, you can easily launder money through fine art. Your odds of getting away with it, again, for right now, are actually pretty good. If you get caught, at least a lot of the cases I've seen, if you get caught, uh, you're probably getting caught due to something else you did. The actual gun running, the actual embezzlement, the trafficking or whatever. And then the art as a laundering mechanism only gets discovered later in the investigation. Like in yeah, Philly, when, yeah. where, they, where they busted the drug dealer and they were like, wow, this guy has great taste. Man, this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that surprise when you open the storage unit and you're like, oh my God, there's 33 paintings in here that are all worth, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Why wow. can't this happen with like grimoires, books of the occult, obscure reference works, or comic books? I would be cleaning up. Jeez, but, uh, man. You can open yeah. my storage unit and you can just find all my son's clothes. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be kind of creepy if I didn't know you. <laughs> uh, what do you but, do with them? They're, they're sentimental value, you know? Right. And kids grow so fast. Right? Mm-hmm. What's the, hey, what's the uh, shortest amount of time that a pair of shoes fit the kid? Uh, the One of the latest ones, we got a Minecraft shoes uh, uh-huh. for the beginning of the school year. So August, this past August, and he's completely outgrown them now. Wow. That's so, fast. Yeah, that's pretty fast. All right. Well, uh, as you know, I'm a big fan of your kid. Uh, it goes I both think, ways. I think he almost beat me at skee ball. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. I just got to enjoy my brief time in the sun. Anyway, uh, children's shoes aside, things you find in public storage spaces can always be weird. And that's why sometimes they get robbed. But what we're talking about now, this money laundering problem, is all just the traditional old school hustle. We have to admit that the rise of new art, things like non-fungible tokens, NFTs, can also produce opportunities for money laundering in theory, and only time will tell what happens with all those nifty new technological toys. Especially Persin- when you bring yeah. in the crypto the crypto techniques, right? Yeah. When you're talking about money laundering, like it's a whole new world there. Yeah, yeah. Until people figure out who Nakamoto is, <laughs> well, like we don't, we don't know. Uh, so, for the more cynical folks in the crowd, I would say myself included, candidly, there's also the issue of corruption in the halls of power. A lot of people participating in these conspiracies also have influence in the world of business and politics. We are talking big fish, capital B, capital F. It can be plausibly difficult, or even at times dangerous for you know regular authorities to make a fuss it might even hurt re-election chances for some politicians especially those that depend heavily on private campaign donations which can come from those capital b capital f big fish yeah if you've got the money to you know hide away in art at the extent that some of these players do then you can imagine that a campaign donation isn't out of the question especially if it's going to benefit you personally in some way Yeah, and art as an avenue for money laundering, really money laundering itself as as a kind of art form, Mm -hmm. these aren't things that immediately impact the average person. So there's not a ton of on-the-ground momentum to change this dirty status quo. In fact, the majority of the stories about this in the media kind of take this wealthy folks are bad angle, which is honestly misleading. There are scads get it, Georgia natives, Mm. of affluent folks who legitimately just dig art or a certain artist. It's either for their own personal enjoyment, maybe it's a social flex to talk about at the next fundraiser. And of course, there are people who rightly see this as a genuine, if at times, wobbly investment. Matt, as we're at the close of the show, I have to ask you, with this regulation, I know that we've both read up on this. Um, do you think it'll have teeth? Do you think it'll make a difference? Well, I think back to that to that example we gave of the 450 something million dollars that was spent on one painting. And that was done at an auction, a somewhat above board auction, right? That kind of transaction, I think it will be easy to enact regulations on. When it comes down to the private buying that we outlined up at the top, I think it's going to be extremely hard for any regulator in any country 
to get a firm grasp on those transactions. Right. Because so many are pre-existing, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And, and how do you list those as assets, right? Like where, where do they enter the legal system? Right. There's a, there's an app out there or at least one that's being developed right now that's supposed to, what is it? Art pass. I think something like that art pass ID. It's supposed to allow buyers and sellers of fine art to like have their identity information to like hand it over when you're making a transaction basically. Uh, But who knows if it's going to work well or not. It's a group of Dutch tech entrepreneurs who are creating it. You can read about that in the art newspaper. Um, But there's that kind of thing where like tech is trying to come in to offer a solution of like, yeah, if dirty money is a problem in the art scene, maybe there's a way for us to exchange identity information without having to get into regulation. And it's more of like, I don't know, you can do it on the level of the transaction. I see. Kind of like we're the, we're going to regulate ourselves mm-hmm. to avoid overreach from institutions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, all the best to them. Uh, but you can easily see, folks, why so many people would be cynical about this changing uh, just because of the conflicts of interest involved, because of the amount of money involved and because of the um, potential for nepotism involved. Yeah. Well, because of the layers, right? There are layers of shell companies that often make these actual transactions and representatives of representatives of a group that is actually working for the benefactor who's going to own that art. Agreed. So now, fellow conspiracy realists, we pass the uh, little auction gavel to you, Thunk. Uh, What do you think? Do you have uh, any personal experience with the world of fine art? Are you an artist who has uh, seen some shady stuff go down at galleries? Are you yourself a curator who has been trying to keep people honest? Uh, Do you find yourself, whether you're in this or outside of this, do you find yourself also assuming a cynical perspective here? And if so, why? We would, as always, love to hear your thoughts and we try to be easy to find online. Yes, you can locate us on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube where we are Conspiracy Stuff. On Instagram, we are Conspiracy Stuff Show. Please, if you like this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the show and give us a review. We'd appreciate it if it was, I don't know, five stars or more. But, you know, we get it. We'd love to just get your feedback. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. Please do that. If you don't like social media, there are other ways to contact us. Yeah, let's say you have a message for Matt or Doc or Mission Control or uh, the one and only Mr. Noel Brown or me. You can call us directly on the telephone. It's the hottest new uh, thing. All you have to do is dial one eight three three S T D W Y T K. You'll get a message letting you know you're in the right place. You get three minutes. Those three minutes are yours. Do with them what you will. Uh, we ask that you give yourself a cool nickname or moniker because it always makes our day to hear them. And let us know if we can use your name and or message on the air. Most importantly, don't feel like you have to censor yourself. If you have a story that needs more than three minutes time, then write it all out. Attach those links. Send us those pictures. We read every single letter we get. We can't wait to hear from you. All you have to do is drop us a line on the internet uh, where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.